Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is April 11th, 2023. This video is called Glorification, and uh, it's going to be a continuation of Christ's letters to the seven churches, and this will deal with the church of Laodicea. Today is April 11th on our calendar, but it's the sixth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Biblical calendar. Today's Tuesday. Last Wednesday was the day of Passover, the day upon which the Passover lamb was slaughtered according to the law. And that Passover lamb was to be eaten that night, which was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And for seven days, there was to be no leavened bread in the household. On the day after the Sabbath, which was just two days ago last Sunday, that was the Feast of First Fruits. Now, all of these feasts and biblical holidays have prophetic meaning. God does not intend that we actually carry out these festivals now, even though we may do so in order to learn um, the meaning of uh, things, the biblical meaning of things, the meaning of the parables that God gave us, because these feasts are really parables. They tell prophetic truth. The blood of the lamb on Passover that was slain, the blood of the lamb was to be put on the lintel, which is just over the door, and upon the doorposts. What does that represent prophetically? That's the blood of the lamb, Christ, that we are to apply to our minds, to renew our minds. The doorposts represent our arms, our legs, applying the reality of Christ to what we do, everything that we do. When we walk along the way, when we talk to others, our life should be one of uh, communion all the time with God and with men. Then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember Jesus said, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples didn't know what he meant. Jesus was talking about their sin and their hypocrisy. We are to live a life that is unleavened. A life without leaven. That means a life without sin and a life without hypocrisy. And then on the day after the Sabbath, the Sabbath, of course, was Saturday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the day after that, that was when they were supposed to offer a, um, a wave offering of the first fruits of barley. So in the scripture, barley is one of the prophetically represents the overcomer. And that was the day when Jesus was resurrected. It was on a Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. He presented himself in heaven with his own blood. And that's what, that's what opened the way for us to go into the presence of God, into heaven. So all of these things are prophetic. They're all parables. And since we're in that time, I wanted to share that with you so that you would have an understanding of what those feasts really mean. Now, today we're going to look at the letter to the church in Laodicea. starts in verse 14 of chapter 3 of Revelation. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, 
the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus represents who he is before he begins to tell the church of Laodicea what he thinks of them. So he begins by saying the words of the Amen. A book I'd like you all to get, if you don't have it, is this one by Andrew Jukes. It's called The New Man and the Eternal Life, Notes on the Reiterated Amens in the Gospel of John. He wrote this book in 1881, or at least it was published in 1881, 142 years ago. And I'm going to read to you from the introduction because it's very profound, and I want you to consider the days we live in as you listen to how he described the day that he lived in. beginning with the introduction. Nothing is more characteristic of the present day than the tone of questioning and doubt which so widely pervades all realms of thought and every section of society. Never, probably, in any former period of the world's history was there such mental activity, division, and anarchy of opinion as we now see around us everywhere. Science has opened so many fields in all of which much is yet unsolved. Believe the science, right? Especially when it comes to COVID. Believe the science. Philosophy has searched so deeply into the nature and origin of man, unsettling much that was once believed, but supplying little certain to take its place, while the growing complications of society force upon us questions still more practical as to the rights and wrongs of men. Oh, like uh, the gender debate today, you mean? No, I don't think he was dealing with that then, do you? To every one of which all sorts of jarring answers are returned from every side. Above all, the church, which should have been a guide and light to men, is so divided and unable to guide herself much less the world, that thousands, I would say millions, I would say billions, are asking whether there is or can be any certainty for man, whether all that has been counted truth is anything more than probability, whether therefore it is not better to, con to confess that we can never get beyond guesses, even upon those points respecting which our inmost souls are constantly and importunately asking for more light. That was 141 years ago, or two, 142 years ago, that Andrew Jukes said that. He thought the world was in disarray then. Who would have thought that the world could fall so much further. Now there was another age which in much of this resembled ours. The age which saw the breakup of the old world civilizations. When not Greece and Rome only seemed bankrupt, so far at least as truth was concerned, but when even Israel, which had been set to be a light among the nations, was turned like the sun into darkness, and like the moon into blood. But then, as ever, when the night was darkest, the morning was at hand. Into that dark age he came who could meet the doubt with certain truth. See, it sounds like Jukes believed that he lived in a very dark age. And indeed he did. But it wasn't this dark. He had always been in the world, although it knew him not, always giving to as many as received him light and power to become the sons of God. Now he was made flesh and came with a faith which overcame the world and with a truth which made the darkness light. He did not argue. He was the truth. 
and bore witness to the truth. And those who received his witness could set their seal that God is true and has not left his creatures. The truth yet lives. What he then said, he is saying now, heaven and earth shall pass away, but his words shall not pass away. His creatures need him, for he formed them for himself, and he alone can satisfy their need. Their ruin was the lie which brought them death. Their salvation is the truth which brings eternal life. As the truth, therefore, he has come, as prophet, priest, and king, to teach, to comfort, and to rule, suiting his revelation to our need, warning where warning is required, comforting and helping those who need comfort. Has he no message for a doubting age? Can he give no certainty to those who are like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed? He came to Israel perplexed with the groups of Pharisees and scribes. And for those who received him, there was certainty and rest. Is he absent from us now? To the last apocalyptic church, that's the church of Laodicea that we're studying now. To the last apocalyptic church, which as many believe, figures the state in which the professing church is is to be found just prior to our Lord's return, and which, if free from certain sins which had so grievously disfigured some earlier churches, was yet more than any other possessed by the spirit of untruth and self-delusion which said of herself, I am rich, and knew not her true state, that with all gifts she was wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The same Lord appears and speaks as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Does not this title tell us that in him we may have certainty for doubt and help for our need if we will listen to his voice? I'm just going to interject something here. He said that Laodicea might be free from certain sins which had grievously disfigured earlier churches. Well, I'm sure he's talking about the sins of the doctrines of Balaam and Jezebel, at least. But no, they're not free of those sins. They partake of those sins as well. She has all the sins. She's in bad shape. Going on with what Jukes wrote in his introduction. For this Amen has himself uttered some memorable Amens. So Jesus calls himself the Amen, and he has uttered some memorable Amens. And of all his words, none are perhaps more weighty than those which are thus prefaced by reiterated Amens. That means he says it twice. By which, as with a trumpet, he calls attention to the truths so introduced as though he foresaw how slowly we should apprehend them. Of sayings thus distinguished, twelve have been recorded for us, all peculiar to the Gospel of John. And if under the law the Amen could seal the judgment of the unfaithful wife, making the very water of the sanctuary to become a curse if she had played the harlot. That's in Numbers 5, verse 22. If the Amen of God's people Israel could confirm their curse should they depart from God and work abomination, that's in Deuteronomy 27, verses 15 to 26, If when, if when in the church men bless with the Spirit, the Amen closes the blessing, as we do with our prayers. If in the book of Psalms, which belongs to both covenants, I believe all the books belong to both covenants, the first three volumes of its prayers are sealed and concluded by the same redoubled Amen. What shall we think of those sayings of the Lord himself? which he has thus specially marked with his reiterated affirmation. 
Can I serve my brethren better than by calling their attention to these amens of the amen, the faithful sayings of the faithful and true witness? As to the words, amen, amen, or as the King James Version says, verily, verily, or as the English Standard Version says, truly, truly. For amen means simply true or truth. Does not the form of expression itself reveal something both as to our state and the grace of him who, if we cannot hear the whispers of his love, will yet choose other and more unusual forms of address, if only he may arouse and bring us to communion with him. True, true, I say unto you, says the truth. Does not the language imply that we need light, but that we are but dull hearers who require something startling to awaken our attention? Is it not like saying, I must speak as to one who will not believe me, but upon oath or as a witness in a court of justice? For this is not the language of friend to friend. What friend needs to say to another? Amen, amen, verily, verily, or truly, truly, what I'm saying to you is true. It rather tells of distance. that we know so little of Christ's mind and can learn so little from his example that we need unusual and even repeated and solemn asservations to make us listen to him. It is as if his oath and bond were required by us before we could believe him. But it also tells us of him that he will stoop even to this, that no false pride or shame will keep him from exposing the true state of things if there is any breach of distance between us, that he will still meet us where we are, and if indeed the whispers of his spirit are drowned by the clamor and cravings of our flesh, he will not therefore leave us to ourselves. But will condescend to words which, if not such as he would or such as best become him, are yet required by our necessity. Therefore he says, Amen, Amen that being roused by such a witness and receiving his words, at first simply on his authority and without any due sense of their eternal truth and blessedness, we may in due time come to know their power, that they are spirit and they are life. And prove in our experience that he that believes on the Son has the witness in himself, and that he that has received his testimony can set to his seal that God is true. Well, this is how Jesus reveals himself to the church of Laodicea. The words of the Amen. The words of the truth, the faithful and true witness. So he begins by telling them, I am the truth and what I am speaking to you is true and I am the faithful and true witness. In Revelation chapter 19, when we see Jesus returning on a white horse, 1911, 
we see this. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. But he says more than this in his introduction. He says he is the beginning of God's creation. The beginning of God's creation. Have you ever thought what that means? What is the purpose of creation? In Genesis, it says that God created man in his image. In his image. But yet, almost immediately, man falls into sin through disobedience of God's express command. And was that, did that take God by surprise? Of course not. Who allowed Satan into the Garden of Eden? Did Adam open the door? No, he was there, wasn't he? Who, who, who allowed him in? God. Did God have a purpose for Satan being there? Of course. What was that purpose? To deceive man so that man would fall. And why? Because God had not finished his creation yet. See, the goal of God in creating man was to create a being that had material reality that was like himself in a moral sense. In the sense that ultimately he would be righteous like God himself is righteous. Jesus came in the flesh, lived a totally righteous life, and then died for his creation, died for those whom he had created, and applied his own blood in heaven when he appeared in heaven as the wave offering on the Feast of First Fruits in order to reconcile us to God and to provide a way that we could become sons of God, full sons of God, completely in God's image. And Jesus, here in verse 14 of Revelation 3, Jesus is called the beginning of God's creation. He is going to bring many sons to glory. And the reality is the creation that God is making is a creation of glorified beings that are fully in his image, have been made fully in his image. And to understand that, we need to understand just who Jesus is. So let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. In describing Jesus, Paul says this in verse 15, 115 of Colossians. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Well, there's that same word, 
the firstborn of all creation, perfect. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all, th all things were created through him and for him. Whether dominions or rulers or authorities, he's speaking both of worldly rulers and spiritual rulers, including Satan. Jesus is the creator of the angels. Jesus is the creator of Satan. Jesus is the creator of the earth. Jesus is the creator of man. The creator, our creator, came and died for us. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the ecclesia. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, here, Paul tells us who Christ is, what he is, what he has done, and that he came to reconcile us to God. And he says that he's doing this to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him, before himself, before God. But only, only if indeed you continue in the faith. Now see, here we have the warning again, just like the multiple warnings in the book of Hebrews. All of the prophets say the same thing. You are saved. Christ died to save you. But knowing that now, you have a responsibility. You have something. You have the seed of God now planted within you. Are you letting that seed grow? Do you water it? Do you feed it? Is the seed producing fruit? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling, Paul says in Philippians. He's talking about the salvation of our souls, where we give up our selfish lives, our selfish souls, that we lay them down for Christ's sake. That's how we continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. And so that's where Jesus begins just in the introduction to the church of Laodicea. In the next video, we will talk about what he says now to them concerning their state. Have they done that? 
Have they continued in faith? Have they been stable and steadfast? We will look at what he says about them and we will discuss things that they can do to remedy their incredibly apostate situation. And Jukes is right. I believe the church of Laodicea is the last day's church. It's the church we have today. And if the church was that bad 142 years ago, how bad is it today? Churches will allow anything in. They'll call any evil good, some churches. I want to just remind you of what he said at the very beginning of the introduction. Above all, the church, which should have been a guide and light to men, is so divided and unable to guide herself, much less the world, that thousands, I believe billions, are asking whether there is or can be any Certainty for man. Whether all that has been counted truth is anything more than probability. Whether, therefore, it is not better to confess that we can never get beyond guesses, even upon those points respecting which our inmost souls are constantly and importunately asking for more light. The church should have been a guide and light to men. It is so divided and unable to guide herself, much less the world. That's the church of Laodicea. I think that Jukes believed that his church, the church of his day, was the church of Laodicea. And here we have fallen 142 years into such depravity, as mankind and as the church. And Jesus speaks to that church of Laodicea as the truth, as the faithful and true witness, the firstborn of all creation, because he fully intends to bring all creation into the fullness that he planned from the beginning.